welcome to lecture 14 of machine learning from data and you know this is one of my favorite lectures of the course because we're going to sit back and we're going to take stock of all the theory that we have built all the foundations that we have built up to now it's not going to be a very mathematical lecture but we're going to condense those foundations into three very important learning principles okay and you know whenever you approach a machine learning problem you want to stick to these principles like glue now, before we get going, let's uh, talk about what we did last time. So we talked about validation. So we're constantly after this link from the in-sample to the out-of-sample, in particular the out-of-sample error. And the VC theory gave us this error bar that links E in to E out. Validation gives another estimate of the out-of-sample error. It directly attempts to estimate the out-of-sample error. And, you know, the basic idea is quite simple. In the standard setup, you take your data set and you learn and you produce a final hypothesis G. Now, behind closed doors, here's what you do. You take that same data, Okay. You split it randomly into a training set and a validation set of size k. From the training set, which is deficient some data, you produce a deficient hypothesis g minus, and you evaluate that hypothesis on your validation set, outputting the validation error as your estimate of the out-of-sample error for g. Now, is that a good estimate? Well, it depends. Okay. If k is too large, so actually the validation error is an estimate of the out-of-sample error of g minus, so you'd like k to be large for that estimate to be accurate, but then if k is large, you know, there's a big deficiency between G minus and G. Okay. So how do we get over this? That's cross-validation. It's the queen of validation. And if you can computationally afford to do it, that's the guy to go for. Okay. Cross-validation allows us to essentially do validation with a K of 1. So you only sacrifice one data point in the training set, but an average over all possible choices of that one data point. So you output the cross-validation error, which is in some sense the estimate of the out-of-sample performance when you learn on n minus 1 data points and you output that as the out-of-sample error for g. Now, you know, you, now we have two of, we have two sort of ways to estimate the out-of-sample error. One is the VC error bar added on to the in-sample error, which gives us a bound. And the other is the cross-validation estimate ECV. And, you know, you know, if your hypothesis set starts out as relatively simple, then the VC error bar usually wins or it might win. But, you know, very often in practice, the cross-validation estimate beats the upper bound because, you know, it, it actually goes after an estimate of the actual out-of-sample error. Now, one of the most important uses of validation is model selection. You have a bunch of models. They produce, you can think of, of them as finalist hypotheses. And how do you pick one? You can use validation. If you've held out a validation set, you can use validation to pick one. Okay. Very useful for a supervisor who has a bunch of minions who are all going at it with the data. The supervisor doesn't need to know what they did. They just produce their final hypotheses, their finalists, so to speak, and then the supervisor can select. Okay, so that's validation. What's going on today? Today we're going to talk about these three important principles, and they, they address the three parts of the machine learning problem. So what do you do before you see the data? You have to pick your, your hypothesis set. You have to pick your model. And, and you know we're going to study Occam's razor in this context, which basically says pick your model carefully. Okay. Now, after you've picked your model, before you see the data, now you need to go and get the data. So, you know, how do you get the data? You have to get your data carefully. Okay. And sampling bias is, is one of the pitfalls that many machine learning applications fall into. And so we'll address sampling bias. Okay. And then, you know, after you've now gotten your data, you need to use your data. You need to handle your data carefully. And again, one of the pitfalls that, you know, of many, many applications of machine learning fall into is data snooping. So we'll discuss, you know, data snooping. So we'll discuss Occam's razor, sampling bias, and data snooping. Okay, so let's talk about Occam's razor. And, you know, the quote below is generally attributed to William of Occam. And here's what he says. You should trim down any explanation of the data to make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. Okay, now let's take this in the context of scientific disciplines. So the data is golden. So you, whatever theory you have has to explain the data. But there may be many theories that can explain the data. And so what Occam is suggesting is that, you know, you know, you should pick the simplest that explains the data. Now, what about the explanations that do not explain the data? Well, you can throw those out because, you know, in the scientific disciplines, the data is golden and any correct theory must explain all the data. Okay. And in the machine learning context, let's, you know, put it in, into a nice principle that we can box. Okay. Basically, what Occam is saying is well, the simplest model that fits the data is also the most plausible, is the better model. Okay. And I've highlighted, you know, the simplest model, and I've highlighted most plausible. So basically, by most plausible, we mean better, not most beautiful, not the one we like. You know, and, 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 and we're not we're not talking about some aesthetic, you know, you know, plausibility. We have a very concrete, you know, so, sort of definition of what's better, and we are thinking about the out of sample. 
Okay. Now, let's nail down, you know, the simplest model. What does that mean? And, and let's nail down the most plausible. What, what, you know, what does that sort of mean? And if we were to operationalize this principle, okay, basically what we're saying is beware of complex models that fit the data. Okay, so now let's nail down, you know, simplest and plausible, and then let's look at a couple of examples. Okay. So what does simpler mean? Now, we've actually seen simple in two contexts up to now. The first is, you know, when we studied regularization, we talked about simple hypotheses. So we in, in, introduced this complexity penalty omega of H for a hypothesis. And in various disciplines, the notion of a simple hypothesis has, you know, cropped up in, in, in many shapes and forms. Okay, so we have this complexity penalty for a hypothesis. You can think about low order polynomials. You can think about hypotheses with, you know, small weights. You can think about easily described hypotheses. Okay. And that's a very computational sort of definition of a simple hypothesis. Now that we have computers, Turing machines basically, now that we have computers, we can think of the complexity of a hypothesis as being quantified by the length of the shortest program that can compute that hypothesis on an arbitrary input. So there's a hypothesis h of x, you're going to give it an arbitrary input x, okay? And now you're expecting to see h of x come out, and there's a box, which we can call a computer or a program, and the shortest program that can faithfully compute h of x, you could quantify the complexity of, of a hypothesis by that length of that shortest program. Okay, so there's this notion of the simplicity of a hypothesis, and then when we study the VC theory, there's this notion of the simplicity of the hypothesis set. Okay, so we, we had this, you know, VC penalty, omega of H. Okay, this guy, omega of H, the, the, the complexity uh, penalty, error bar, that links E into E out. And that essentially is an error bar that quantifies the complexity of your hypothesis set. So simpler hypotheses sets have, you know, a small VC dimension, or if they're finite, a small number of hypotheses. And in, in, in electrical engineering and other, other areas like, you know, physics, we can quantify the, the complexity of a set by its entropy and so on and so forth. So, that, so there are different ways to quantify the simplicity or complexity of a hypothesis, and there are different ways to quantify the complexity or the simplicity of a hypothesis set. So on the one hand, you have an object, on the other hand, you have an, a set of objects. And these two are linked. And there's a fundamental link okay, that, you know, if you have a hypothesis set with simple hypotheses, it must be a simple hypothesis set. It must be a small hypothesis set. And we can sort of easily see that link if we, if we look at, you know, hypotheses that are easily described a la programs. Okay? So if you have a hypothesis set with simple hypotheses, then it means that hypothesis set is, is, is only containing hypotheses that can be implemented by, sh by small, by short programs, but there are f way fewer short programs than long programs. So, you know, by just a counting argument, the hypothesis set has to be small. So simple hypotheses, if those are the only ones in your hypothesis set, then it must be small, and so the hypothesis set itself is small. So there's a link between these two. And we saw, we had a glimpse of this link when we studied, you know, regularization, where we, where we started with a, with a soft order constraint, which is this constraint on H, so it constructs a smaller hypothesis set, Okay, and then we did math and this and that and this and that, and we, we, we gradually reduced, you know, learning within a smaller hypothesis set to, the, to being equivalent to learning with a penalized error, the augmented error, where you penalize the complexity of a hypothesis. Okay, and so there's an equivalence there. We saw that equivalence, you know, in a, in a, in a way when we studied regularization. Okay, so that's what simpler means. So we have to, we, 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 so in, in, in essence, even though we might think that there are multiple, you know, sort of, you know, appearances of simplicity in, in our context, simple hypothesis versus simple hypothesis set, they're essentially the same. Okay? And they're quantified by, for example, you know, omega of h or the VC dimension or what have you. Okay, so that's what we mean by simpler, and simpler is better. Okay, so why is simpler better? Okay, and now I'm going to, you know, take you back to my childhood. You know, I used to, you know, um, and I used to love reading, you know, Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm in gray here. I've highlighted, you know, one of uh, an excerpt from from a story. Now, Detective Gregory is the typical detective who doesn't, is a bumbling detective, doesn't know what's going on, and you know, he asks Sherlock, um, you know, is there any point to which you wish to draw my attention? Okay. And then Sherlock says, you know, to the curious incident of the dog in the night time. And then you're thinking, okay, and as, as the bumbling detective is thinking, you know, the dog did nothing in the night time. So why are you pointing my attention to this dog doing nothing and calling it a curious incident? And, you know, that's exactly what Sherlock says. He says, that was the curious incident. Okay, so now let's think about this. Okay, so 
you know, the detective is bumbling around looking at clues here, looking at clues there, and so on and so forth. And, the, and, and Sherlock Holmes is sitting here looking at the dog and wondering, you know, why didn't it bark in the night time? Okay, now there's a crime that has been committed and no one heard the dog bark. Okay, and, you know, that is very surprising. Okay, that the dog did not bark. Because, you know, if a stranger comes and commits a crime, you expect the dog to bark. Okay? And the fact that the dog did not bark is very surprising. And therein lies its significance. So, so you know, and, and okay, if I continue the story, the conclusion is, well, the dog not barking is a very significant observation, which the bumbling detective, you know, missed. But obviously nothing escapes Sherlock Holmes. Okay? And Sherlock Holmes said, well, that's a very significant uh, thing because the likely thing you know, is for the dog to bark, and the unlikely thing happened, and so that's very significant. Okay. And then the detective finally gets it that, oh, that means that, you know, whoever did, committed this crime was not a stranger to the dog. Okay. Because typically crimes are committed by strangers, the dog would have barked. Okay. And what's the moral of this story? Okay. Okay. When something unlikely happens, if you get surprised, okay, something significant has happened. Now let's take this to the context of, you know, um, uh, learning and why is simpler better. So you have a simple hypothesis set. You're approaching a, a big data set, let's say 100 data points. Well, when we say simple hypothesis set, we're usually talking about simple with respect to the number of data points you're going to see. So you have a simple hypothesis set. You're approaching 100, 200, 1,000, a million data points. And what are you expecting? You are expecting to utterly and miserably fail. You're expecting a, a, an in-sample error close to 0.5 if you're doing classification. And, you know, that's because you have a simple hypothesis set. But what a surprise if your simple hypothesis set can fit the data. Something very unlikely has happened. You are truly surprised. It's very significant. It's very significant now. If, you know, expecting to fail, you succeed. Okay? Something is going on. Something interesting is going on. Okay? And so that's sort of, in, in a parable, why simple is better. Because simpler is better because when you fit the data, you are more surprised. And let me show you that, you know, in, in a very simple setting, that will sort of the, that will sort of make the point very striking. Okay, so let's consider a scientific experiment. Okay, now you know there's this physical theory, and we postulate that you know the resistivity of a metal is linear in the temperature T. So that's the physical theory postulates this. Okay? So we send out a scientist to investigate, and scientist three comes back. You know, and has collected, you know, the resistivity with very, very, very careful measurements, has collected the resistivity for three temperatures and, you know, finds that, you know, okay, so they're almost on a line. Okay, there's this red guy who seems to be an anomaly, or is it an anomaly, or have I falsified the theory, or what have you, who knows. Okay, so scientist three comes back with this data and, you know, say, okay, thank you very much. Okay, and scientist two, you know, comes back with this data. Wow! Okay, unbelievable. Scientist two has come back with, the, with this data. And scientist one comes back with this data. Okay, so has collected this data and also looks like scientist two has managed to fit a line to his or her data. Okay. And the basic question we're going to ask is, which of these scientists have provided the most evidence for the hypothesis resistivity rho is linear in temperature T? Okay, so pause the video okay. and think about this question. And, you know, rank the scientists in order of who has supported this theory the most. When I say the most, I mean, you know, most, then second most, and then third most. And then we will discuss. So pause the, vid pause the video. One, two, three seconds. Okay, now, if you're coming back and you just want to hear the discussion, here we go. Let's compare scientist two with scientist three. Okay, so that's our first, you know, attempt at analyzing this, this, this sort of, these scientists. Okay, so scientist two has provided, I mean, in my opinion, very convincing, you know, evidence. Because look, he has collected three data points and, you know, a line beautifully fits those three data points. Scientist three, on the other hand, you know, you might say, well, you know, scientist three has, in some sense, what we, what we call scientist three is a falsifier. Scientist three has falsified the hypoth hypothesis under the assumption that the data is exact. And we all know that in, in you know, in, when you do these physics experiments, you know, there's measurement error and so on and so forth. So if we allow scientist three a little bit of slack because, you know, there's some error, there could be some errors in measurement and so on, well, then scientist three has provided some evidence. Okay, some evidence, you know, because we know that, you know, measurements cannot be exact. And in fact, having said that, we might go back to scientist two and fire scientist two 
because I'm starting to suspect that scientists too has falsified the data. Because I mean, how is it possible? There's measurement errors and this and that, and, and, he, and he's got three data points that lie exactly on a line. Okay, whatever. Okay. You know, I'm starting to suspect scientists too, but assuming that everything is above board, scientists too has given us but basically very convincing evidence for the linearity, but scientists three, you know, if there's noise in the data, it's, it's pretty decent evidence. Okay, now let's compare scientist one with scientist three. So we all agree maybe that scientist two has just given us golden data, golden evidence for this uh, theory. Okay, but now, now let's consider scientist one versus scientist three. Well, we, we might argue as follows. Scientist three has give, basically has, has, you know, said the theory is wrong. Although if we allow noise, some evidence. What about scientist one? Okay, that's the interesting guy. Okay, and I claim that scientist one has given us no evidence for the theory. And I don't mean, you know, like scientist three, you know, has maybe given us some evidence, okay, depending on how much noise is in the data. Scientist one, on the other hand, no evidence, zero, zero, flat, zero. Okay. And, you know, we all know that you collect any two data points, you can send a line through it, okay? So, you know, this doesn't provide any evidence at all whatsoever that resistivity is linear in temperature. Resistivity could be exponential in temperature. And scientist one who collected two data points would still be able to send a line through his two data points. Okay. So let's try to pin down in exactly what way is scientist one, you know, giving us no evidence. Scientist two, of course, we all agree is, 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 is the best evidence. But I would, I would take scientist three's data over scientist one. Scientist two is perfect. Scientist three's data at least gives some evidence. Scientist one gives no evidence. Now, let's look at it from the point of view of the surprise factor. In, 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 in scientist two's case, you know, both scientist two and scientist three are collecting three data points. And when the line, which is a simple model, fits the three data points, man, are we surprised. Wow. Very unlikely to happen. It happened. Okay. We are so surprised. It's significant that it happened. Scientist three, we're expecting a total, you know, mess and he almost fits the data. So we're pretty surprised. Significant. Scientist one, we're not surprised at all. There's no surprise factor. There's no wow factor in what scientist one did. Okay. So no evidence. It's not significant at all. Okay. Now, we can sort of summarize this in what's called the axiom of non-falsifiability. Okay. And let me tell you, this is a fundamental axiom. Okay. It's a fundamental axiom in the physical sciences. And it basically goes like this. You have a hypothesis. Okay. And you'd like to you know, run an experiment to, to test your hypothesis. Okay. It must be the case that your experiment has a chance to falsify your hypothesis for it to be worth running the experiment at all. In other words, if your experiment has no chance of falsifying your hypothesis, then the experiment provides no evidence one way or the other for the hypothesis. It cannot, you know, it cannot say the hypothesis is false. It cannot say the hypothesis is true. Now, scientist, th scientist two, when collecting three data points, could have been falsified. The fact that scientist two was not falsified is meaningful. Scientist one could not be falsified because there's no way to collect two data points that can falsify the linear hypothesis. So scientist one could not be falsified. No point doing this experiment. Someone should have just told scientist one, don't waste your time collecting two data points. It's of no help whatsoever. Cannot say that the theory is true. Cannot say that the theory is false principle, the axiom of non-falsifiability. If you cannot falsify your hypothesis, okay, then don't waste your time running the experiment. Now, how does this come into machine learning? Okay, so falsification plays a fundamental role in this notion of why simple better. And, you know, so, so, so we'll, let's go back to now our, our, our good old friend, the growth function. Okay, and let's consider a, hypo a, a, a hypothesis set H that shatters a data set x1 to xn. So you've got a data set x1 to xn, and h shatters. Now you go and generate your y values, because you know that's what that what you know you do when you collect the data. You have your x values, and then the target function runs and gives you examples of for your you know of, of f in action. So you get your x1, y1, x2, yn, and so on. Okay. But if your hypothesis set shatters the data, now here's a little exercise for you to prove. Okay. No matter what y values you put there, you can get in sample error zero. So don't be surprised if you fit the data when your hypothesis set is complex enough to shatter the, the, the data. 
Okay, don't be surprised. And if it's not surprising at all, then you know it's not significant at all. Let's you know reformulate it a little bit more concretely. You know, you, you, if your hypothesis set shatters the data set x1 to xn, then the experiment of collecting the y values is pointless because you can think of the following hypothesis. You can think of the following sort of you know you know claim that you're trying to verify. The hypothesis set H is a good set of candidate hypotheses for F. So think of that as you know what you're trying to verify by going and collecting the data. Now, when you collect the data and you see that some member of your hypothesis set fits the data well, you conclude, wow, yes, my hypothesis set is a good set of candidate hypotheses for F. And what's my evidence? Look, I fit the data. But if your data can, is, is shattered by your hypothesis set, don't waste your time. Okay? Because you can't falsify that claim that the hypothesis set is a good set, is, is a good set of candidate hypotheses for F. You have, in order to, for the experiment to be worth running, it must be the case that you can falsify the claim. Now let's look at the other situation. H doesn't shatter your data x1 to xn. In fact, you know, you know, in, we could we could even make a, a stronger statement. You know, H cannot shatter any data set of size n, so the growth function is small. Okay, then. If you imagine that the target values are generated, you know, randomly, then the probability, or so the, the number of dichotomies you H can implement is M sub H of N at most. Okay. So the probability that it will be able to implement whatever dichotomy is generated, if you generate randomly, is M sub H of N divided by 2 to the N, because you're going to generate each of the dichotomies randomly. So the probability that your hypothesis set is falsified is 1 minus of, you know, M sub H of N divided by 2 to the N at least. Because m sub h of n is the is the maximum number of dichotomies, not necessarily the number of dichotomies on your data set x1 to xn. Okay, so if m sub h of n is polynomial, then you see this term, the one, the, this m sub h of n divided by 2 to the n is minute. So the probability to be falsified is almost 1. Now imagine your surprise okay, when you go and run the experiment, generate the y values and try to fit, and you find that you fit the data extremely well. You didn't, for example, got in sample error zero. You didn't get falsified. It's a very surprising outcome. It's a very significant outcome. Okay. So a good fit is surprising with a simpler H, and hence it is more significant. Okay. You could have falsified your hypothesis set. You could have falsified the claim that H is a good set of candidate hypotheses for F, but you didn't. And the fact that you didn't okay, is significant. So that's how simpler is better sort of enters, and that's where the theory put, you know, a, a sort of a quantifiable uh, notion of better on, on learning. Okay, so, so, you know, simpler is quantifiably better because you get this low, this smaller error bar. But intuitively, it's because the hypothesis set can be falsified easily by the data, and when it doesn't falsify, it's significant. Okay, now I'll read you a quote from, from the textbook, okay, because there's a, a, a slight difference between between Occam's principle for the sciences and Occam's principle for machine learning from data. And what is that fundamental difference? The fundamental difference is that in, in, in the Occam world, in the scientific world, you know, a theory either, 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 either explains all the data or it's wrong. Okay. So we're not interested when we talk about, you know, theories for physics about, you know, theories that explain some of the data. Even if there's one data point that, you know, the, 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 the theory cannot explain, you throw it out and you need to look for another theory. Now, machine learning is slightly different because, you know, our goal is to predict as much as we can, as well as we can. Our goal is to get the out-of-sample error small. Okay? And so, in order to get the out-of-sample error small, it's not necessarily the case that we must get in-sample error zero. Okay? And so let me read the quote. We may opt for a simpler fit than possible. Okay? So we may go even simpler than what Occam says. Occam says, go as simple as you can, providing you fit the data. But we may go even more simpler. Okay? Namely, we will go for an, imp an imperfect fit of the data using a simple model over a perfect fit of the data using a more complex model. Okay? And the reason is that the price we pay for the perfect fit, so in order to get that extra bit of in-sample error down to zero, the price we pay in terms of model complexity Okay, the price we pay in terms of the penalty for model complexity may be too much in comparison to the benefit of the better fit. Okay. So le machine learning has taken Occam's razor sort of a step further and says we can tolerate you know larger in sample error. 
Okay. And so there's this trade-off. It's not that we go for the simplest fit that explains all the data, because you may have to go to too complex a model, especially if there's noise. Okay. So we'll go, we, 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 we can quantify the trade-off between the in-sample fit and, and then the out-of-sample, the complexity of the hypothesis set, and, and the sum of these is what we optimize. So we go a step further than Occam. We can actually trade off the two. Occam says you can't trade off the in-sample error. That must be zero. So now get the simplest hypothesis that accomplishes. In machine learning, we can trade off. So we can go for in-sample error slightly bigger than zero because otherwise we pay too huge a penalty in complexity. Okay, now let me show you an example from the real world, just a fun example. Okay, you can think of it as a puzzle. Okay, so um, here's a puzzle. So, you know, you're a big football fan and on, on, a, on Friday, so there's, a, there's what's called a Monday night football game and on Friday you get a postcard. And the postcard says the home team will win the Monday night football game. So, you know, obviously you're used to spam, you just throw it in the trash. But Monday night comes along and indeed, you watch and the home team won. Now, you don't make too much of this except in the back of your mind you're thinking, you know what, that postcard guy got it right. Okay. Next Friday comes along and you get home and you see, oh, there's a postcard from what looks like the same guy. Okay. And it says, you know, uh, away team will win. And so, you throw it in the trash, obviously. And so, you know, you're used to this stuff. You know, it doesn't take you a second to throw things in the trash. And so, you know, but anyway, Monday comes along and you watch the game and, you know, sure enough, the away team won. And now your mind is going back and saying, wow, that guy got the first game right and then the second game right. And this happens, you know, for five weeks in a row. This happens for five weeks in a row. Friday comes along, right, you get a postcard. It says home or away, one of the two will win. And sure enough, uh, you know, that team won. So a sixth week comes, like you come home early from work, looking, looking, looking everywhere for the postcard. And indeed, there is this postcard, but it doesn't look the same. It doesn't look the same. You know, now there's a 1-900 number on the postcard saying, you know, you need to call this number if you want to know what my prediction is, and I'm going to have to charge you 50 bucks for that. So you're thinking, wow, you're thinking Vegas. You're thinking, well, you know, if this guy is really going to get this prediction right, the 50 bucks is nothing. I'll go and bet a thousand bucks on the game, and, you know, I stand to win a thousand bucks. So... You know, the hypothesis here is that this guy's a perfect predictor, or at least a very, very good predictor to get five in a row. Okay. Now, the question I'm going to ask you, and this is the puzzle. Okay. So, you know, immediately you look at this, and whenever someone charges you for something, you say, this is pure nonsense, this is a scam, and you throw it away. So, indeed, you know, that's a perfectly valid thing to do. Throw it away and forget about it and just go and have dinner. Okay. Or, because we're all machine learning people, we can say we've got data. This guy predicted correctly for five times in a row. Okay, and you know, he's asking 50 bucks, but you know, I'm gonna ask a different question. Okay, so it's a, probably a scam at 50 bucks. Okay, but how much would you be willing to pay for this guy's prediction? So if he had put 25 bucks, would you pay? If he had put five bucks, would you pay? If he had put one buck, would you pay? Okay, so how much would you be willing to pay? Now, some of you might just say, I'm not gonna pay anything. I'm not even gonna pay a cent. And I say, that's not very rational. So we're trying to approach this rationally. How much would you be willing to pay? So pause the video come up with a number, and then let, let's see if we can analyze, you know, what's going on here. Okay, so I'll give you one, two, three, four seconds, and if you pause the video and are coming back, and you've got the answer, great. Let's see if we agree. Okay. Now, you know, lucky for you, you took machine learning from data, and you learned about, you know, shattering and complexity and so on and so forth. So let me put this puzzle in the context of machine learning. Okay, and who are you? Okay. You might think, well, I'm just a person. No, you are a hypothesis. Okay. And what are your data points? Your data points are the five games. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. So five games occurred. And on these days, you know, you predicted one, zero, zero, one, zero. Let me pass that for you. You predicted home, away, away, home, away. Okay. And indeed, all your predictions were correct. Well, it wasn't actually you who predicted, but you got the predictions. Okay. And you think of yourself as being the implementer of this hypothesis or the reader of this hypothesis. So you saw one hypothesis that fit all your five data points correctly. And as far as you are concerned, you have a single hypothesis that worked. You have a single hypothesis that has been verified on five data points. And we can now, you know, apply half bound bounded this and that and this and that and try to see, you know, what, what are the chances that, you know, this guy is, 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 is worth 50 bucks for the next prediction. Okay. Now, what, what you are going to pay this guy, de you know, depends on. So you, you can think of yourself as a hypothesis that has in sample error zero. Okay. And 
the, one of the lessons, fundamental lessons in this course is that just getting the in-sample error zero is not enough. You need to have the link from E in to E out. And that link comes providing you haven't tried too many things. Okay. But wait a minute, you're just the single person who got the prediction and that's where you are falling for the scam. Okay, so, you know, how do you know that what's going on behind the scenes is a hypothesis set of just one, which is you? Okay. So now let me show you what might have gone on behind the scenes. On day one, okay, your smart postcard mailer, you know, sends to 16 people all predictions of home game and sends to 16 people all predictions of away game. So you know, nothing to stop him from doing that. Okay, that's fine. And then you were one of the people who got all the predictions. You were one of the people from the 16 who got home predictions. Okay, and sure enough, you got it right. Now, what happens on day two? Okay, on day two for the for the next Friday's prediction, you know, this guy knows who he mailed out to. So he what what he does is he ignores the people who he got it wrong for. Okay, all the people who got it wrong for, and focuses on the people who he got it right for, which includes you. Okay, and now mails out another. 16 postcards, but on the second day, half of these people will get home and half of these people will get away. And you happen to be one of those who got away and that happens to be correct. And okay, so on day three, what does he do? He ignores all these people who he got it wrong for because, you know, as far as they're concerned, they're looking at him as a completely useless, you know, predictor because he's got one right and one wrong. Okay. He wants to really make an impression. So he focuses on the people for whom he got it right. And, you know, I just put in the other people who he got it wrong for if he had you know, you know, tried the same game with the zeros, he would have said half ones and half zeros, okay? But instead, he focuses on, on, on these zeros who were also correct on the first, second day. So now he's, he's got eight people who he got it right for the first and second day. And to those eight, he splits them into two and sends four, four home and four away. And lo and behold, you got the away and that was right. So you are still in his list and he forgets about these other four and, and focuses on the four he has gotten right. But for these four he has gotten right, he has got three in a right, three, three days in a row right. Okay, two of them get one, two of them get zero. One means home, zero means away. Okay, and happens to be that the home team won. So he focuses on you two and, you know, um, 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 on the next day, on day five, he focuses on you two and sends one of you one and one of you zero. And lo and behold, you are the single person who has gotten all five days right. Okay. But now, it's very sort of instructive that I put the entire strategy among all the 32 people on board here. Because, you know, you could imagine that he has surreptitiously, okay, implemented the, 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 the postcards that have also happened in gray. Okay, why surreptitious? Because he didn't actually mail them out, but he has implemented them. He has evaluated, you know, what would have happened for those guys in the sense that he knows that they're not going to get an in-sample error of zero. Okay. But now if you look at the hypotheses that have been tried, you know, he has, he has effectively, you know, searched among a hypothesis set, which is all one, then all one, then zero, then all one, then zero, one, and so on and so forth. You'll see that every possible hypothesis on five data points is represented here. It's just that he didn't actually mail out the cards. He could have. He could have mailed out all the cards. Okay, he could have mailed all the cards, but I just presented the, 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 the approach that's a little bit more efficient for him. He could have mailed out all the cards, but he didn't. Why? Because he's only focusing, he's only looking through this hypothesis set for an in-sample error of zero. And how did he find the in-sample of error of zero? He first focused on the first data point and said, which hypotheses among you have in-sample error zero? So U16. Then he focused on the second data point and said, which among you have in-sample error zero? And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's U8 here, U8 zeros who got, who got zero on the second day. Then, then he focused on the third data point and said, which among you have in-sample error zero? And then he focused on the fourth data point and said, which among you have in-sample error zero? Then he focuses on the last data point and said, which among you has in-sample error zero? And you're the sucker who gets the postcard for 50 bucks. And now if you think about it, you, you can see that he has effectively, you know, searched this entire hypothesis set for the one hypothesis with in-sample error zero. And he has a hypothesis set which is the most complex possible. It's a non-falsifiable hypothesis set. So, so this football oracle basically tried every hypothesis. Okay. And now we are asking the question, how much should we pay for this prediction? So we can figure out you know, how to pay for this prediction by, by, 
asking the following question. I'm going to pay an amount for this prediction that prevents the oracle, this football oracle, from performing this you know, exhaustive search. So let's see what this exhaustive search costs. Well, he has mailed out, you know, including the one final postcard to me, he has mailed out one plus two plus four plus eight plus, you know, 16 plus 32. And we all know this, you know, sum of, you know, exponential, that's going to be 63. So he's mailed out 63 postcards. If you imagine printing, stamp, effort, and so on and so forth, let's just say 50 cents per postcard. Okay, so 63 postcards, 50 cents per postcard is approximately 33 bucks, 32, 33 bucks. Um, oh, 32 bucks, that's approximately 32 bucks. So if he was asking for 32 bucks, he would have he would have been able to implement this. He's asking for 50, so not only has he implemented this, but he's gonna make you know something like an $18 profit. So how much would you pay? You should pay much less than 32 bucks. If he offered if he offered this to you for one buck, then you pretty much oh well he, if you if he offered it to you for one buck, then just the postcard that he sent you, he's taking a loss on. So if if you want to enforce that. The only person this guy sent postcards to, okay, then you would you would pay at most three bucks. Okay. But if you allow him a little bit of flexibility in his prediction, maybe you'd pay five bucks. So this guy's predictions might be worth, let's say, five bucks. Okay. But I'm not telling you to pay five bucks. I'm just saying that this is a principled way to sort of analyze such a question by asking what could have gone on behind closed doors. Could this person have searched a huge hypothesis set? And I'm the sucker who 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 got all the predictions right, in which case the price I pay should be a price that prevents him or her from searching the whole hypothesis set. Okay, and so, you know, the lesson here, the lesson here is that the in-sample error is zero. Yes, but that's only the second step of learning. The in-sample error being zero is meaningless, meaningless, without knowing the complexity of the process that led to that in-sample error of zero. That's what's going on in learning. Okay, that's what's going on in learning. That the in-sample error is meaningless, and I mean literally meaningless, unless you know that the process, the hypothesis set that led to that in-sample error being zero is a simple hypothesis set. Okay, let's move on to sampling bias. Okay, so we covered Occam's razor. Let's talk about sampling bias. You know, this cartoon pretty much captures a lot of what can go wrong when you when you poll or you do medical testing and you you know you apply some kind of a filter to decide what subjects are suitable for your test. And in this case, this is of course an extreme example. You've got your animals, and we're going to apply the same test to all the animals. So that makes it fair, right? Okay, so we apply the same test to all animals. What's the test? All of you must try to climb the tree, and if you succeed, you're suitable for my test. Okay, and obviously, what's going to happen here? Only the monkeys make it into the medical trial. You. You, f you find that your drug works well on monkeys, and then you apply it to the whole animal population, and surprise, surprise, it's a disaster. Okay? This is a classic example where the filtering process introduced a sampling bias. Now let me show you a, an example from history, and it's a, it's a pretty impressive mistake that was made. It made headlines, let's put it that way. November 3rd, 1948, Chicago Daily Tribune reports Dewey defeats Truman. And they don't report this in small letters. It's big, bold, Dewey defeats Truman. Okay. Now, what's going on here? Well, it turns out that you know there might have been impending strikes the next day when when the election would have truly been announced. Um, you know, the Tribune had some newfangled you know technology that they could allow them to go to press early. So they thought, you know, let's put our statisticians to work. Go take a poll and figure out who's going to win. So the statisticians go. Okay, they figure, well, how, how are we going to poll people? So they pull out the phone book. Now, what do they do? They randomly pick people from the phone book. And I want to emphasize, randomly pick people from the phone book, call them up and ask, how did you vote? Not how are you going to vote? How did you vote? Okay. So then they, you know, it's, it's, it's the bin model. You, you figure out, you know, how many voted for Dewey, how many voted for Truman. You figure out the, the ratio, the, 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 the fraction who voted for Dewey. And then if that, if that, if that fraction who voted for Dewey is above the Hufting error bar, you can confidently say Dewey won. And that's what happened. Okay, but Dewey, Dewey, who's Dewey? Do we know any Dewey? We don't know any Dewey. Truman was president. And indeed, you know, the next day's headline is Truman holding up the Chicago Tribune headline from the previous night that Dewey won. Well, what? absolute embarrassment. Okay, and this is an embarrassment that the Chicago Tribune is never going to live down. Okay, so what, what happened? Were the statisticians all wrong? Did they not know how to use the Hufting bound? No. So pause the video and see if you can figure out what exactly went wrong. Exactly what happened was what I told you. They picked up the phone book, they randomly selected people to call, okay, and you know, 
having you know called a random selection of people you know they did the usual Hufting analysis on the fraction of red people the fraction of people who voted for Dewey okay. and it turns out that, that, that this flaw in, in, in the polling has existed for a while in the election setting okay because that was a standard way of, of, of sort of figuring out how to you know decide how to call, you call up and figure out who's going to win the election and so try to think what happened okay I'll give you a few seconds okay. one two three four okay if you're coming back having paused the video and you know you said there must be some sampling bias here well you know you're smart why else would we include this in the sampling bias section okay and if you're just here for the ride well here's what happened okay what went wrong and um you might wonder is it if they went back and redid this poll would they get a different result no even after the result is is, is announced they could go back and resample the telephone book and figure out you know what fraction are voting for Dewey. they would find over and over and over and over and over again that that Dewey is winning, even though Truman actually won. Okay, and so you're wondering, well, is the Hufting error bar wrong? No, the Hufting error bar is, is live and well. And and the Hufting error bar would, if they had indeed truly sampled randomly, it would have been a very unlikely outcome for Truman to win. Okay. The problem is they sampled from one bin and tried to make a, a, a statement about another bin. And remember, way back I said, you know, I'm going to emphasize that you know this obvious principle that when you sample from one bin, you can only make a statement about the bin you sampled from. Okay. And this is why when we do machine learning, the, the data is generated according to some probability distribution P of X. And that's the same probability distribution that generates your test point. Otherwise, we cannot link E into E out. Okay. So what went wrong here? And it's very similar to the cartoon. Okay. What happened was they used the phone book although from the phone book they picked randomly but they used the phone book just like it's only the monkeys who can climb trees think back to this era and who could own a phone it wasn't a trivial you know uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a trivial undertaking to own a phone it was a, it was an expensive device so who could own a phone and therefore who would be listed in the phone book okay ah figured it out it's the rich people okay and so this is very similar to that filter that you you know you only get to participate in my drug trial if you can climb the tree the phone book is implicitly performing a filtering towards rich people okay? and so among rich people it is true that Dewey beats Truman but that's not the full population one bin Dewey beats true Dewey beats Truman Okay. But that bin is not the full population, and you cannot make any statements about the full population by looking at a different bin. And you might say, but isn't it approximately, isn't it approximately the case? No. This is an example of sampling bias where you've sampled from one bin, and you're trying to make a conclusion about another bin, and when that happens, all bets are off. We cannot make any statement. Okay. You might as well have polled in, in Australia and asked, who's going to win, Dewey or Truman? Or who would you vote for, Dewey or Truman? And then come and report in the Chicago Times, Dewey defeats Truman. And, if, and in fact, historically, this kind of telephone poll has always overestimated the, the Republicans' actual fraction of voting. For that very reason, sampling bias. So when I said people make this mistake, it must have been, oh, that's so obvious. Well, look, not only did they make the mistake, it made headlines. Okay. So now let's summarize this into a principle. Okay. So I'll just read the principle. If the data is sampled in a biased way, so now we're talking about how you get your data for learning. If the data is sampled in a biased way, the learning will produce a similarly biased outcome and we have no idea what the true out of sample error might be. Okay. Now, operationally, make sure your training distribution, i.e. the distribution, the data generating process that generates data for training, for learning, and the test distribution, the, the data generating process that generates data on which you will be tested, make sure that those two distributions are the same. Okay. Basically, you cannot sample from one bin and then make statements about another bin. Very important. Now I'm going to show you some examples that, you know, uh, have been somewhat recent, much more recent than the, you know, the, this presidential election debacle. Okay. And the first has to do, is, is very close to home for me. So, you know, the kids come and they're, and they're like, you know, ah, my friends, they all have a much better life than I do. And I'm looking at them and I say, you guys, wow, how spoiled can you be? I mean, you should have seen me when I was growing up in Zimbabwe and Sri Lanka. I used to walk uphill going to school, uphill coming back from school. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you've heard all this. Stuff. But I, I thought about it and I said, wait, why do you think that your friends have a much better life than you do? 
They said, well, look, look on, look on, look on, you know, whatever, whatever they are using these days, Instagram and, you know, and uh, Facebook, it used to be and so on and so on. Look, look at what, look at all these pictures and all this, you know, fancy stuff and all this, um, um, you know, vacations and stuff, all this fun stuff they're doing. And I look at this and I look, scroll, 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 and I say, wow, yeah, wow, they do seem to have a good life. What's the problem? Think about it. What's the problem? Yeah, give you two seconds. And if you said, well, it's sampling bias, well, you're just, you know, you know that we're in the sampling bias section. But if you really figured it out, think about it this way. What they're seeing on the social media is their friend's highlight reel. No, you don't post your entire life on social media. You post your highlight reel. Okay, now you post your highlight reel, sure, the, the percentage, the fraction of good stuff in your highlight reel is going to be close to 100%. So now you infer from that bin, the highlight reel bin, that their life is comparable. Okay, You are taking one bin's sample, the, the, the fraction of good stuff in the highlight reel, and trying to make a, 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 a statement about another bin, sampling bias. So I'm looking at my kids and saying, you know, how am I going to tell this to them? Am I going to say, you know, well, son, you cannot sample from one bin and then make a prediction about another bin. They'll look at me like I'm crazy. So figure, figure it out. How am I going to help my kids through this sort of major trauma in their lives? That, you know, the, the friends are having a much better life than they are because you can get depressed otherwise. Think about it. I'll give you a couple of seconds. One, two, three. So here's what I had to do. And it was, it went against the, every grain of rationality that I had in my mind, but I had to do it. I had to tell them to post more on social media so that then they could compare their bin, their highlight reel bin to their friend's highlight reel bin. What they were doing was comparing their friend's highlight reel bin to their, you know, regular bin, their everyday bin. Wrong, bad, something biased. Be very careful. It can crop up in very subtle ways. Okay. And it's cropped up in the professional, you know, literature. Okay. So you can you can search. There's a there's an article, taller, fatter, older, how humans have changed in a hundred years. Okay. So there's a study that studied you know British recruits a hundred years ago around 1914 and 2014. So it's about a four-year-old paper, and it concluded you know that we're growing taller, fatter, and older. Okay. Now what's going on here? What's going on here is they they studied British army recruits, and then you might think. Well, did they just study the British population today in general? No, they studied the British Army today. Okay. And, but that is a filtering process. So that is a sampling bias. You're, you're sampling uh, bias in, in, in 1914 and you're sampling bias in 2014. And we have no idea in general how these biases will affect what's going on. So now you can try to think about, you know, um, um, what exactly could be going on? Because it looks like we're comparing apples to apples, but we're not. And if you're interested, you can see, you know, I wrote it up on my blog, which is which has since you know stopped being updated. But I, I have analyzed this specific issue. Okay. Um, the, the one I want to get to is a is a much more contentious issue, which is you know a, a few years ago, you know, in a flagship journal, uh, there was a, an article published which said the GRE test is a, is, is a test that fails. And so what was the study based on? The study was based on the fact that if you take incoming students into a, let's say, you know, a technically oriented field like math, physics, engineering, computer science, and so on, you, you look at these students, and then you look at their math GRE. So look at the math GRE of these students, and then some metric of success, like did they or did they not graduate with a PhD? Okay. And you find that there's no correlation between the incoming math GRE of these students and whether or not they um, you know, graduated with a PhD. Okay, so pause the video and try to try to pin down what's wrong with this kind of a study. Okay, I'll give you a few seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, if you're coming back and you said sampling bias, well, by now you figured it out. There's sampling bias in all these examples. But okay, what specifically? Okay, so let's think about this a little bit. Well, we, we what's the sampling? What's the filtering process? What's the sampling bias that's going on? And let's try to figure out how it's is resulting in this you know conclusion. Okay, so what's the filtering process? There, there are students who have already been, who have been admitted to a PhD program. And that's a, it's like the monkeys who climbed up, you know, the tree. It's like the animals that managed to climb up the tree. These students, so there's the sampling bias. These are all students who have been in, in, uh, put into the, who have been accepted into the PhD program. Okay, but you might think, well, yeah, okay, but fine. So they're all students who have been accepted. And then, you know, we study whether or not um, the, the math GRE is predictive 
of you know whether or not you'll get a PhD. So you say, well, what, what's wrong with that? Can't I do that analysis? Well, you can, but think about the admissions process. You know, surprise, surprise, you know, the admissions officers and the professors, whoever they are, when they're admitting students, they don't admit students who they think are going to fail, who they think are not going to make a PhD. So you look at a student and you see, okay, this guy has fantastic GREs and blah, 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 and you admit them. And then there's another student, okay, the, the GRE is slightly worse, okay, maybe a little bit worse, maybe even a lot worse, well, the GRE is much worse. But now you're deciding whether to admit, you will look for compensating factors. Oh, does this, does, does this person work hard? Does this person done something else? Has this person maybe published a paper previously? Okay, and so you look at this and you see oh, all kinds of other good stuff has happened. So you admit the student because you think they will succeed. Okay, and, and if us admissions officers were perfect at our job, then we would only admit people who basically succeed. And when you look at whether the GRE math is now correlated with whether or not you succeed, everyone succeeds. And that's because we take that into account in the admissions process. So, you know, there might be a variance in the incoming GRE, but that is not on its own indicative of whether or not you will succeed because there are compensating factors that are taken into account. Now, pause the video for a few seconds and think, what is the correct experiment to run in, in for example, all these cases, but in the last case in particular? Okay, what's the correct experiment? One, two, three, four, five. If you're coming back just for the right, well, here's the correct experiment. Here's what you actually have to do. Take a bunch of, let's say, 22-year-olds. Okay, administer the GRE math on them. Good. Okay. Now, no matter what score they get on the GRE math, and I mean random 22-year-olds, now no matter what score they get on the GRE, admit them to graduate school. And then give them all the same amount of mentoring. So you see how hard this experiment is to do in practice. Give them all the same amount of mentoring. And now see who gets a PhD and who does not get a PhD. And see whether it's correlated with the GRE math. Especially in a field like math or physics or computer science. Okay, now what I'm saying is I'm not saying that maybe the GRE has its flaws and maybe it's not that correlated with the outcome. Okay, but you know... Um, you know, I'm not making a claim that it is the best test on earth, but what I am saying is that the experiment that was run is flawed, is fraught with sampling bias. You need to run a different experiment to make that conclusion. Now, what's going wrong? So you saw the experiment that has to be run. The experiment that has to be run is take random people, administer the GRE on all of them, and take them all into the PhD program, and then see who graduates. Give them all the same amount of mentoring. That experiment is never going to be done. That's the ideal data for the machine learning conclusion to be, you know, trustworthy. Okay? And so when it, whenever things involve humans in some way, shape or form, we rarely do the ideal experiment, the ideal experiment that is dictated by the theory. We use what's called convenient data. Beware of convenient data. It's fraught with sampling bias. Now, let me give you one final take on sort of, you know, sampling bias. And then I'll give you a puzzle. Okay? And, um, you know, and then we'll move on to data snooping, another buzzword. So, um, you know, you've probably heard it said that extrapolation is always harder than interpolation. So interpolation is quote unquote easy, extrapolation is hard. Let me show you the sampling bias view of this, or i.e., you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you learn from one bin, you better be tested on that bin, not on some other bin. And I'll show you an experiment that, you know, you know, Think about this experiment. So when our book came out, you know, I was following the Amazon ranking and, and correlating it with, you know, the number of books that were sold. Okay. And you see the blue dots here. So the ranking 8,000, no surprise that, you know, the more books you sell, the, the, the better your Amazon ranking. Uh, low is good. Okay. And everyone wants to be the best, the top, top selling book on Amazon. So I thought, ah, wow, hmm, how many books should I sell, you know, in order to, um, you know, get this high, let's say, in the ranking. And, you know, what I do, I did, I did the usual thing. I said, oh, this data looks linear, you know, let me fit it with a line. And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. Extrapolate to the point where I'd like to get my ranking and see how many books do I need to um, sell. And when I do this prediction, it says, oh, you need to sell about, you know, 25 books. I said, oh, that's nothing. I'm happy to buy 25 books if it gets me such a, such a low ranking, but I thought better. I said, you know, I know about machine learning from data. I know that extrapolation is hard. So, you know, let's see if I can ever get here. If the, if the book's ranking ever gets here, maybe we'll, we'll know how many copies should, should be sold. Okay. And sure enough, it did. And there, red, that's how many copies needed to be sold per week in order to get a, a ranking in this region. Oh, what 
didn't I, didn't I do the linear regression correctly and so on and so forth? Well, the problem here is, you know, is that extrapolation is hard. And now let's relate it to, you know, sampling from one bin or, or learning from one bin and trying to predict in another bin. So interpolation is sort of, you know, the data is distributed in a certain way. You generate data according to that distribution and you try to predict inside there. That's interpolation. So what is extrapolation? Extrapolation, you're explicitly you know, asking for a prediction that is not representative of the data. Interpolation is asking for a prediction that is representative when inside the data you have seen. Extrapolation is explicitly saying, you know, I'm not interested in, you know, predicting somewhere here or here where it looks like your data was generated. I'm interested in predicting here. Very dangerous. Okay. You're, you're learning from one bin and trying to make a prediction according to some other probability distribution. In this, in this case, in some sense, an adversarially se selected you know, data out, uh, 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 input. Okay. So important, when you learn from one bin, the test point should be generated randomly according to the distribution from which you learn. Okay. So this is a mismatch of the, of the training bin and the testing bin. Okay. And so what can you do when you have such mismatches? So on the, on, the, on the top right, I'm showing you one example of what you can do, which is you have to think very carefully. You have to help the learning. You have to think very carefully about what F should look like. And in the case of, you know, rankings on Amazon, if, you, if you're familiar with sort of social processes, you understand there's a sort of a fat tail behavior. So you shouldn't use a linear model. You need to use some kind of a hyperbola model. And when you do indeed fit a hyperbola model to the blue data, you get a much better prediction. So here you have to really think if you're doing something like, let's say, extrapolation, or if the training and test uh, distributions mismatch, you have to help the learning a lot. You have to really narrow down, you know, what could the target function look like in your choosing of a good hypothesis set. Okay. And there are also techniques that can, you know, uh, attempt to correct for the training test mismatch, for example, by reweighting data samples and so on and so forth. So, you know, you can read up on those techniques. It's, it's, it's going a little bit beyond the, the, the flavor of this course. Okay. But I will say that if, you know, your, your data distribution from which you learn has no support, has no representation in the, in the, in the distribution from which you would like to test, from which you would like to deploy, you're done. There is nothing to do. You have to be very careful. It's basically you're doing extrapolation, and extrapolation is hard because the training and test distributions, the bin you're learning from, and the bin you're going to make a, make a claim about, the bin you're going to make predictions on, are very different. Okay, now here's a here's a here's a puzzle that you know you may have been wondering about from the very beginning because we used credit analysis as as our sort of concrete example, our concrete. Uh, you know, example that went through the whole course okay, and we illustrated all the concepts in this credit example. So here, you know, I give you an applicant with age, gender, salary, and so on, and I'm asking you to determine whether or not to give credit. Okay. And banks have lots of data and, and you know, customing, all the customer information is there and they know whether or not, you know, well, they defaulted on the credit. Okay. So think about it a couple of seconds. This is the puzzle. Where's the sampling bias? One, two, three, if you're coming back just for the ride, the sampling bias, whether or not who defaulted on their credit. And you can only default on your credit if you were given credit. So they actually have only got data on, on, on customers who were approved for credit. And then you, you can look and see, did you or did you not default? Sampling bias, just like filtering into the PhD program, filtering the monkeys from all the animals and so on and so forth. Okay, Sampling bias, you have one bin of data i.e. those who have been approved for credit from which you're trying to learn, but then you're going to try and deploy this system on all customers. Okay. Now, in some sense, if the, if the approval of credit was reasonably lax, then it may not be such a bad the situation here because, you know, there are those who were approved who, you know, are clear approves and they don't really affect the decision boundary. And then there are those who are rejected who are clear rejects and they don't really affect the decision boundary. But, the, and, and then close to the boundary, maybe the, they were a little bit lax and or, or, the, or, or their approvals were a little bit more aggressive and so they approve a, a nice band around the decision boundary and that band is all you need to get a good decision boundary for deployment of you know your system on all customers because that band is still going to reject all the clear reject it's going to approve all the clear approvals and then you've done a good you've done a good job of of filtering out or figuring out what to do with the boundary cases okay so it might be okay but let me give you an example where it's a complete disaster imagine if their original approval system was perfect so everyone who they approve was a, a good credit risk now you learn from this data and your machine learning algorithm looks at this and says for all inputs that i've seen 
you know, they were good credit risks. And so the simplest, you know, hypothesis that fits this data is the one that just says approve everyone. Now you go and implement this on all, all, all applicants and it is a complete disaster. Okay. So that is just to show you that when there's something biased like this, things may be okay. They may be a disaster. It's just that all bets are off. We have no idea. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. How could you use the system that's learned from this kind of data? How could you use it? Okay. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay. Think about it. Pause the video. Okay. If you're coming back just for the right, one way to use it okay, is to say, well, you know, I can't use it on all people. So I'm only going to use it on the bin that I trained on. So you can use it as a cascade, which you can put on top of the, the original approving algorithm. So what you do is you say for the bank, listen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to improve your system. So give me the data from your system, which is all the approved customers, and then those who defaulted or not among those. And I'm going to learn how to fine tune. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use your system and then my system. Okay. Now, if your system was perfect, my system will just approve, will just approve all the things that went through your system. If your system was not perfect, maybe I can fine tune and do better. Okay. So that's one way in which you can use this data to improve the system. But then you're going to lose, you know, all the people who were rejected, who should have been approved. And if there were biases and historical issues with who got credit and who didn't, that could lead to severe, you know, societal inequity. So this is a very challenging problem. Okay, how to deal with this, this, this sampling bias? Okay, so okay, so we discussed Occam's razor. Pick your model carefully. In other words, a simpler hypothesis set is better. And then we discussed sampling bias. Make sure that your training bin and your testing bin are the same. If they're not the same, some kind of sampling bias is present. Now, you know, when they're sampling bias, all bets are off. Anything could happen. You could be okay, like in the credit application, if you, know, you have enough data around the boundary. But more often than not, it's a complete and utter disaster. We just have no way of knowing what can happen when there's sampling bias in the data. And all conclusions that come from data that's, you know, sampling biased, you know, I distrust them, you know, without any reservations. Okay. Now let's talk about data snooping. Data snoop literally, it's sort of trying to get a subtle peek at the data in order to make some subtle choices and you, you know, so that you know, what, what, what will happen when you get the data looks great and you think you've gotten away with it, but you have not. Okay. You cannot get away with data snooping. Now let's sort of, you know, form, formulate data snooping in a little bit more precise way. And, and to, do, to do so, we have to sort of, you know, re-examine why we have data. Why is data so fundamental to machine learning from data? Okay. And data really has two purposes. The first is to learn from. Well, the second is to assess. And the data snooping is usually occurring when these two get irretrievably mixed together and, you know, and, 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 and you think that your assessment is good, but it's not. Okay. Now, let's summarize this in a principle. Okay. If the data has affected any step any choice in the learning process, then the data cannot be trusted in assessing the outcome of that process. Okay, so I'm going to repeat it because this is a very, very important, you know, principle. So the data is, because we use the data for learning, you know, if effectively that means that we use the data to make some choices. For example, choosing the hypothesis, the final hypothesis from the hypothesis set. Okay. So that's the data being used for learning. It affects the choices we make. And now we come around, and we only have one data set. Now we come around from the other perspective and say, you know, we are interested in E out. So can we use the data to assess the performance of the final hypothesis? But because the data affected the process that generated the final hypothesis, you know, when you use the data again, it's now contaminated data. Okay. And so it's not trustworthy in assessing the performance of the final hypothesis that the data itself generated. And in order to make the data, you know, reliable in assessing the outcome of the learning, that's why we had to go through all that hard theory that linked the performance of, of the final hypothesis on the data that was used to generate the final hypothesis. That's why we needed all that hard theory. Okay. Now, if you do really want a trustworthy, unbiased assessment of the performance. If you really do want to assess the performance of the final hypothesis, you have to estimate the performance on a completely uncontaminated test set. So that's the operational principle that comes up from the data snooping principle. Okay. So that means that, you know, whenever you, 
whenever you are thinking that you're going to assess your performance on a test set, you have to lock that test set in a vault and that test set must not affect any choice in the learning process. Now, you know, there is one choice in the learning process that the data has to affect, which is the choice of your final hypothesis from your hypothesis set. And we can account for that choice by making sure that you pick the, the hypothesis set before you look at the data. And that was the reason for that very important principle. You always, always, always must choose your hypothesis set before you look at the data. Okay. Let me now, you know, that, that's the principle. It's a relatively simple principle, but it's very easy to, you know, violate this principle. Let me show you an example. Okay. And it's a puzzle. So, you know, if you go back, let's say to 1985, you know, when we, when we had all this nice financial data and there was the S&P 500, you know, we, today we have what's called the S&P 500. So we can look at the stocks in the S&P 500 as Apple, Google, you know, IBM and so on and so forth. So you take this 500 set of, this set of 500 stocks and we go back to 1985 and we see how did these stocks perform and wow, you know, you get 16.2% annualized return. Okay. Now, for those of you who are not interested in finance, you know, get interested in finance because after you become a machine learning guy, you're going to go out and make lots of money and then put it in the stock market. And if you can get 16.2% return, wow, bingo, bam, wham, you will be retiring in style. Okay. Well, I have news for you. The 16.2% return is actually something that's not realizable. Okay. The actual return of the S&P uh, 500 from 1985 to... to, to basically some, some, sometime around now is approximately, you know, 8.3%. So what is this, you know, factor of two difference in return? That's a big factor. And that, and that shows you, you know, the impacts that things like sampling bias and data snooping can have. Okay. So now let me tell you actually what we did wrong here in this red curve. Okay. So we took today's, you know, S&P 500. Now, and then we looked at how did today's S&P 500 perform over the last, you know, you know, whatever, 25, 30 odd years. Okay. So first of all, there's sampling bias. There's sampling bias because we didn't pick a random set of stocks in 1985 to see how they perform. Okay. So that would be a way to test whether putting money in the stock market is a good idea or not. Okay. But even worse, okay. the, the, the nature of the sampling bias, so how we filtered stocks into our you know, portfolio to, to, to look at what in, included a very serious flaw, which is data snooping. So, you know, we took today's S&P 500 and then we tested today's S&P 500 on, on, on the data from 1985 to 2015, let's say, or 2016. Okay. But, you know, how did we determine today's S&P 500? It is on their performance, on the stock's performance on that very data. So the very data that we're going to test, that we're going to evaluate today's S&P 500 was the data that was used in selecting today's S&P 500. That's data snooping. The data has affected what stocks we choose and it's also going to be now used to assess the stocks we chose. Whenever you use a data set in this dual role to affect the choices leading up to your, to your final hypothesis and then also to assess the final hypothesis, watch out. Data, ideally should only perform one or other of those roles. Okay. And if you're going to use data to perform both roles, you need to know about it and you need to take it into account when you assess. Okay. Now, let me tell you that data snooping is very subtle. It occurs in very many ways. It occurs, you know, usually it occurs innocently. It's not, you know, with malice that you do it. But then when you do it, boy, things look so great. Look at the 16.2% return. Things look so great that you don't think about it. You just think, oh, wow, I've succeeded. I'm such a good machine learner. Okay. But then when you go and deploy this thing, you find, oh, no, it's not getting me 16.2% return. The S&P 500 is getting me 8% return. Now, in this case, it's not a disaster. It could have been negative 8% return. Okay. So in this case, it's not a disaster. But we just don't know what could happen when there's data snooping. Now, let me show you, you know, examples of this very subtle you know, kind of happy hell that you could be in where you think things are great, but it's actually hell. Okay. So how many times have you heard people say, ah, the data looks linear, so I'm going to use a linear model. And then it works beautifully in sample. Data snooping. What does it mean? The data looks linear. Okay. So, you know, you, the linear model was something that you chose and the data affected that choice. And then within the linear model, you picked a specific hypothesis. Now we know, you know how to deal with the within the linear model, you picked a specific hypothesis. That's the DVC. Okay. But we have no idea 
the extent of choice you made in order to choose the linear model by looking at the data. Another way of, of, of sort of diagnosing that data snooping is occurring is if the data were different and didn't look diff and didn't look linear, would you do something different? And if the answer is yes, then data has affected this choice, okay, and you need to pay a price for this choice. Okay. Try linear, it fails. Try circles, it works. Okay. I mean, if you torture the data enough, it's going to confess sooner or later. Okay. And so, you know, eventually this process is, is bound to end in success. So if you have this general process of I'm going to keep trying things until they succeed, essentially your VC dimension is infinite. Okay. You will shatter any data set. Okay. You've lost the first step of learning. Okay. You are data snooping basically in deciding what hypothesis set to, 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 to pick. And, and, and there's no way that we can then use the data to assess the outcome. In a more subtle way, try linear. It works. So I don't need to try circles. That's more subtle. Okay. The point here is, so I don't need to try circles because you're thinking in the back of your mind, if it didn't work, I would have tried circles. So it's very subtle here, but you need to realize that, so I don't need to try circles is a choice. Would you have tried circles if the data was different? Yes. So it is a choice that you made. Now, if on the other hand, you have specified that linear was your hypothesis set and that's the failure condition, things are different. Okay. But when you have in the back of your mind the, 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 the ability to try circles and then you choose not to, it's because of the data and the data affected that choice. And now the data becomes less reliable. You read papers, you see what others did on the data, you modify and improve on that, and now you have to pay the price for all the things that others did. Okay, So, you know, basically you can ask yourself, if the data were different, would that modify what others did and hence what I did? So the data has affected all kinds of choices. Would have affected what others did and what I did. And you have to pay a price for all those choices. In other words, you know, data snooping can happen all at once where you yourself, you know, on, on Monday decide to try linear and then if it fails circles and then if it fails neural networks and so on and so forth. Or someone 10 years ago tried linear and then five years ago tried circles and then you tried neural networks. So the data snooping can happen all at once or sequentially by different people. Okay. It's still data snooping. You have to pay the price. And one final example, input normalization. Let me normalize all the data. Now let me set aside a test set. Okay. Now this is subtle. Okay. Well, the test set was involved in the normalization. So if the test set changed, wouldn't your G change? Wouldn't your final hypothesis change? It would, because if the test set changes, it, it changes the normalization. The changed normalization might change your final hypothesis. So your final hypothesis is influenced by the test set. So you cannot use the test set anymore to assess your final hypothesis. Data snooping. If the data set has in any way whatsoever affected what you did, uh, has affected what you output from learning, then you cannot use that data to assess the learning. Okay? So all kinds of subtle ways in which data snooping can occur. So, you know, let me sort of, you know, <clears throat> give you a sort of a high level, you know, sort of cheat sheet in some sense. How, how, how do you sort of decide whether or not data snooping is occurring? So you ask yourself the following question. If the data were different, would I or could I have done something different? So you explore your entire pipeline from data to final hypothesis and ask if the data changed, you know, does anything in my pipeline change? Okay. In other words, I made choices based on the data throughout the whole pipeline. Does anything change in, in delivering the final hypothesis? If yes, you have data snooping. And so then you have to be very careful in using that data to assess the final hypothesis. So here's the picture that goes along with that. You start with data and there's some path, there's some workflow you take until you get to the final hypothesis. And during this workflow, you know, I put in these green boxes, choices that you might make. Okay, choice one based on the data, choice two based on the data, choice three based on the data and so on. Okay, so at a high level, you have your data set, Okay, and then you make choices and that leads to your final hypothesis G. So now let's see, the, the most fundamental of choices you make using your data set is to, you know, select a hypothesis from your hypothesis set H. That's the most fundamental choice. We can't really avoid that. But imagine if one of these green boxes was choose your hypothesis set H. Now that's a humongous choice you're making. And that makes your data very unreliable at evaluating the, the performance of G, which is basically its in-sample performance. Okay. Now, yes, we did make a big choice anyway, okay, by using the data to choose the final hypothesis. Okay. But we know how to account for that. 
Okay, we know how to account for the choice of, of G from H. That was the VC theory that set up this link between E in and E out. The point that we are making here, and we're making this point very strongly, is that every choice that you make involving the data, you have to pay a price for that. You have to account for it. So the ideal set, setup is there are none, none of these other green boxes except the one green box which re represents your choice of final hypothesis from H, and we know the price you pay for that. That's the VC error bar. Okay. Now, when you make other choices, or if you had the potential to make other choices, you have to pay for the price. You have to pay the price. You have to account for the choices you had, not for the choices you used. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to emphasize: you must account for every choice influenced by the data. We know how to account for the, you know, the choice of H, the choice of the final hypothesis from, you know, from the hypothesis set. But you have to account for every choice made by the data. And I do not know how to emphasize this any more than, you know, make it bold, make it italics, underline, include in a purple box. That's how important it is. Every choice that you, that you make on the basis of the data, you have to account for it. And so if you're going to use that data to assess the final outcome, you have to account for all those choices. Now, let's summarize. Let's calm down a little and summarize. So, we're fundamentally talking about the theory, what the theory established, and in some sense, best practices that you can use so that you don't have to go back to the theory all the time. So, one, Occam's razor. It's a very simple principle. Simpler H is better. But, you know, the theory established that there's this trade-off, and we can quantify the trade-off of, of making H more complex by looking at you know, the in-sample error and how much it affects your complexity error bar. So we have a math that we can substitute in here, but the, the intuition is you know, Occam's razor is related to falsifiability, to, is related to how surprised are you that you fit the data. Simpler H is simply better if you can get a comparable fit. Okay, so pick your model carefully. Sampling bias, generate the data carefully. Make sure you train and test from the same bin, otherwise anything can happen. It's not that otherwise you, you're Almost okay. No, anything can happen. It could be okay. It could be a total disaster. Usually, it's a total disaster. And most of the, the sort of real screw-ups in machine learning from data come from sampling bias. Okay. Just like the headline with Dewey defeating Truman. Um, data snooping. Handle the data carefully. So Occam's razor deals with what you do before you see the data. Make sure you, you know, pick a simple hypothesis set. Sampling bias deals with how you generate the data to learn. And data snooping deals with how you handle the data. You, data is a very, very precious resource. And you have to handle it very, very carefully. The data is a very precious resource. You have to handle it very carefully. And what that means is that anytime you make a choice that is influenced by the data, that diminishes the data's ability to evaluate the final outcome. Okay. So, Think twice before using the data to make any choice. Minimize the number of choices you use the data for. Okay? So in particular, choose your hypothesis set. This big thing, this is a huge choice. Choose your hypothesis set before you see the data because we don't know what's going on in your mind. We don't know the complexity of that choice process for you. So you need to nail it down before you see the data so that the only choice that you're really making now is which hypothesis in your hypothesis set and that we can account. So account for all choices the data influenced. And if you know that there are choices that the data influenced and you don't really know how to account for it, well, then just be careful. Okay. And so three learning principles, fundamental, adhere to them, stick to them like glue. You won't regret it. Checking out. See you next time.